Hello and welcome back to all the young activists, students, and leaders across the globe. My name is Sahar Mohammed Zeta, and I'm a 20 year old young explorer at National Geographic, and I'm a student at Harvard. Now, this is our fifth session of Gen Geo Careers and Exploration. We officially hit the halfway point of the program, which is part of the larger summer learning series brought to you by young people and for young people. Now, this series um, emphasizes National Geographic's belief that you and I, Gen Geo, were the key to addressing the world's most pressing problems. But before you can get out into the world and make that positive impact, you might be wondering, you know, how do you convert your passion into a lifelong career? And more importantly, is that even possible to turn your interests into a sustainable lifetime? Well, I, along with several National Geographic explorers, are here to tell you that the resounding answer is yes. To help you continue on your journey throughout the world, I'll be sharing some behind the scenes looks at the inspiring careers and individuals who bring Nat Geo's mission to life. So no matter where you are in your career, your studies, your educational journey, you have the chance to learn firsthand from National Geographic's very own experts every single week. So make sure to keep tuning in live every single Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Now, so far, we've heard from exceptional educators, phenomenal photographers, and memorable mountaineers. This week, though, we're going to be taking a step back and focusing on a larger core value that National Geographic has, storytelling. Now, whether we realize it or not, narratives are the driving force behind photographs and adventures and even scientific discoveries. I think it's what humanizes our experiences at the end of the day. It fosters a global connection and ultimately is the real change driver. So today I'm here to be, I'm, I'm so excited to be joined by Explorer Inge. Her first story was her actually her own migration story when she was adopted from Korea and traveled to Norway as a baby, resulting in a lifelong balancing act between identities and it triggered an innate curiosity for everything that was different for her. There was a dissatisfaction with current narratives about migration, which eventually encouraged Inge to found Pocket Stories. It connects facilitated people with unheard voices through storytelling to, at the end of the day, celebrate diversity. She's also a facilitator for Changemaker Exchange, which is a global collaboration platform for young social change makers. And she was awarded the European Youth Press Prixes for her migration versus traveling infographic video. And it was awarded at the European Parliament. So listening and recording hundreds of personal stories from around the world has better helped Ingi understand how we are, are interconnected because of human migration. So make sure to tune in and listen on how you can become a change maker at the end of the day. Um, so Ingi, welcome. It is so nice to have you here. How are you doing today? Thank you, Zahar. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm doing really great um, being here in the Netherlands um, and very excited to have a conversation with you now. Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for making the time all the way from across the world. You know, I've been looking forward genuinely to chatting with you for some time now. Um, I think the beauty of storytelling, it seems, is that you don't only bring your own story to the table, but you just inevitably amplify the voices of so many people that you've worked with throughout the year. So if it's okay with you, I'd just like to start the conversation by learning a little bit more about you and your story and you know what are you currently doing? Absolutely, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so... I go by the name Inge, but when I was four months old, um, I was adopted from Korea to Norway. And that's when I was giving my actual full name, which is Ingeborg. And this is a very traditional Norwegian name. And I was brought up in a small rural town on the coastal Norway. Um, and this is where my Norwegian identity was formed among cows, tractor cruising cousins, and of course, skiing. So I was obviously very different from my very blonde and blue-eyed family. So I was always drawn to things that was, you know, different, just like me. And this especially grew when my mother gave me a copy of the Anne Frank diary. And her story 
just got me so interested in personal storytelling and she taught me a lot about what it means to be different. And since then, story listening became like my tool for kind of making sense of the world around me. And since then, I've been thinking like, okay, I think this small town here in rural Norway is great, but what else is out there in the world? And I remember thinking about this lying in the bed as a teenager. And then when I graduated from high school, I knew that I want to go to university, but I wasn't quite ready because I didn't really know what exactly do I want to study. So I took a gap year and went to Australia as a work and holiday uh, backpacker. And I traveled the world for a few years until I realized, you know what, I actually want to do something more than traveling. I really would love to go and live abroad for more like a long term period and see how that is. And I went back and thinking, OK. I need to study. I still don't really know what exactly do I want to study, but I know that I'm very interested in people and in different cultures. So I went to Brisbane and I enrolled at the University of Queensland and I started the classes with anthropology and archaeology. And after a semester, I realized, okay, that's really not my thing at all. And since I love to talk and I love to listen, I thought, you know, intercultural, intercultural communication, that's my thing. And I enrolled and I was about to commence and start picking my courses. But for some reason, I didn't get the message that this major doesn't exist anymore. And I was almost too late to pick a new major. So I had one day to pick something else. So I went with a safe choice. I did a bachelor in organizational communication. I wasn't very happy because it wasn't really what I want to do. But little did I know that actually the skills that I learned during this degree, like communication for change, leadership and entrepreneurship was going to be essential for me seven years later when I founded Pocket Stories. And then I graduated. I got an internship uh, with a PR company. And again, I realized that was not for me at all. And I wasn't very happy with getting this generic communication degree. So I went back to read what I really want to do, which again was focusing on people and culture. So I decided to do a master program. And this was called Master of International Development Practice. And here I really got to learn things like ethics and how do you work with people across different culture in a sensitive way, in a respectful way. But I also learned technical things like how to do social impact assessment and evaluating social projects. All really spoke to me in a way I thought, okay, these are the things that I would like to work with. I got a volunteer opportunity with a local refugee organization. Again, I really loved it because it was about people and cultures. And this led me to two exciting opportunities. I got an internship opportunity with UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Indonesia. And then I went on to get an internship with the International Organization for Migration in Tajikistan, which is located in Central Asia. And I cannot stress how life-changing these two internships were for me, because at one level, I got to learn and understand how Global migration works, um, you know, across the world. I got to understand how migration works on regional levels in different parts of the world. I got to understand the key differences of labor migration and uh, forced migration. But probably the most profound thing that I learned was from two colleagues. Um, this is when I was in Tajikistan. One evening, I was sitting and having a drink with, with the two of them, and they were sharing their stories. One was an American, and the other one was a German. But the American, she was born in Zambia, and the German, she was actually born in Macedonia. And they were telling me their very different migration stories. I was 27 at that age. And while I was listening to their stories, I just felt this deep sense of connection that at first I couldn't really articulate until they came to the end of the story. And I looked at them and I said, oh my gosh, I'm a migrant too. And they're reaction was great because he kind of just laughed at me and they said, well, of course you're a migrant, but you're clearly a Norwegian too, but one doesn't exclude the other. And I said, but for me, this is strange. I never saw myself as a migrant before. Um, and by thinking and reflecting upon that, I said, I feel like by understanding that I'm a migrant, I can start articulate who I am in a new way. And I really had to start reflecting upon my own journey. And I thought, okay, I've been very proud to call myself a backpacker. I definitely love to call myself an international student. And here I was very proud to be an expat working with migration. 
Yet, if anybody tried to hint that I was a migrant, even without using the word migrant, I would become very defensive up until this very moment. Because this is when I realized that being a migrant is just a label that describes a life situation. It says nothing about you know, how my childhood was or what I do for a living or what I dream of at night. It really just gives us a perspective of a time and a place where we have to go through something in life. And I was really puzzled and I thought, okay, so what I've observed is that probably some of the best narratives we have about migration today is stories where we have to emphasize and pity migrants. And I certainly did not want to be pitied as an adoptee. And this led me to the question, why is migration so controversial while traveling is popular? And this question was the one that really fueled me to create pocket stories. Now, this is a foundation today, but when I started it, it was just a project. And to be very honest, I didn't really know, you know what I was gonna do, how I can do things, even if I was qualified. All I knew I had to do something. So what I did online was to, um, and offline, create storytelling events. So I would invite people with all kinds of migration backgrounds, say adoptees, refugees, guest workers, so-called expats and international students together. And side by side, they would tell their migration stories. And it's really powerful because when we tell our own stories, whether about migration or anything else, we find that connection that we have through our shared humanity. And we got to do different kinds of events that was really special, all kinds of stories. And after doing this for a while, what I noticed is that there are a lot of people who actually want to share their story, but there were two things that people tend to ask. One, how do we structure a powerful story, technically speaking? And two, do I even have a story that is worth sharing? And as a response, I designed a storytelling workshop. I thought, okay, over two days, I'm gonna invite all these different people together and this is what we're gonna answer. And what I did was that creating a space where people could really sit alone to reflect, write, and also draw their life experiences up until now. What led me to be where I currently am? And then I wanted them to go together in pairs because we talk a lot about storytelling, but it's equally important to story listen. How can we become better to listen to the stories of the people around us? So I taught skills that you know help people to ask questions that are really center on curiosity and openness to allow people to explore their stories, to either you know confirm yes, you do have a special story. I can't believe that you have gone through all the things that you've gone through and you're sitting here and sharing it with me. Thank you. Or thank you for sharing this story. I can really identify with what you've been going through because I can really, I've gone through something similar and I really feel grateful knowing that, you know, I'm not alone. Um, this is something that I thought that maybe was something I couldn't talk to anybody else. So thank you for sharing in the way that I had with these two women in Tajikistan. So after they've gone through, you know, on their, uh, sitting on their own, reflecting, sitting in peers and coaching, of course, we would create a safe space for them to really share the stories with others, very often for the first time and feeling that empowerment, you know, you know what, I know how to tell my story and my story is definitely worth sharing. It can sound a little bit like it was an easy journey to get here, you know, I, had a question and how to struggle. I came up with a solution, but I can definitely tell you this was anything but easy. It was a bit of a journey where I guess the core of my struggles was I kept questioning, you know, who am I to organize these events? Who am I to do these workshops? What qualifies me to do this work? And that's when it dawned on me that what I learned during my degree, so communication for change, leadership and entrepreneurship, um, the ethics of working with people from different cultures. These are all the things that are brought together in this work. But I think the most important thing that I learned is that there's a lot we can learn at university, but there's even more we can learn when we start listening to people all around us um, and taking their lived experiences, good and bad, and see what are the needs and what can we do together in order to find a solution. And that's what you know this workshop was really based upon. 
And that's what I really, really love about listening to other people's stories can be something beautiful that you give to others, but I also think it's really a gift that you can give yourself. Now, all of this work has given me incredible opportunities to travel across so many countries to meet incredible people um, who has been sharing their stories with me. And it's really been a blessing. I've been in Nigeria, I've been in Algeria, Ireland, Lebanon, France, Germany, Norway, um, and meeting people from all walks of life and especially young people where we try to support them, not only to know how to tell the story, but also how can they become change makers. And this is what you see in the image here. This is outside Amsterdam a few years ago. And all of these experiences that I've gotten to get through all of these years has really led to the biggest project of Pakistan, Root Sky. And this is a collaboration with uh, five of us, as you see in the photo here. See Dan, that's my Dutch partner, which led me to come to this country, the Hub, Hamza and Megan. We have brought in all our experience to create something really special. And it's Roots Guide, um, supported by National Geographic. And Roots Guide is a novel travel guidebook that invites readers to take an inner and outer journey. The inner journey is about learning yourself by meeting about 50 plus storytellers with very different migration backgrounds through their written stories and photography, learning about and exploring who really is a migrant. And then, and additionally, we also have these activities and reflection questions for the reader to really start thinking about how am I connected to migration? And spoiler alert, our idea is that we're all connected to migration. And then they can take an outer journey, which is more familiar uh, for us who are used to using travel guide books like Lonely Planet. That gives a lot of tips uh, where you can go within the Netherlands to explore new places. So this has been uh, a project in the making for four years. Um, we even have been growing into a bigger team. Unfortunately, don't have a photo of everybody involved. There was something like 20 plus people being involved. So all of us been coming together. We come from different cultural background, migration background, different professional disciplines like artists and designers and scientists and social entrepreneurs um, trying to bring our experience into Roots Guide. But it's not enough to have an idea and we have plenty of ideas, but we also really want to test how do we make sure that we're able to achieve what we want to achieve? So we were looking for funding. And after I had been facilitating a workshop in France, one of the participants who knew about Roots Guide sent me a link. And she said, I think you should really have a, a look at this one. This sounds like something for you. I clicked the link, I read the, the call for application. I thought, wow, this is the first time I read something that really spoke to me and I thought this really fits Roots Guide perfectly. The moment I realized that, I saw this was actually National Geographic. I did not know that National Geographic was actually having um, opportunities to, to give out grants. And I, as the rest of my team, we all grew up with National Geographic on the TV, reading their magazine. That's why we dreamt about the world, dreamt about exploration, and never ever thought we thought that this could be something for us. So we definitely thought this was out of our league. But reading the question and application, they were tough, but they were good. So we thought, okay, this is worth giving it a shot. And if we don't get the grant, at least we've been able to really deeply think about what is it that we're trying to do. And now it's been a year and a half since we got the grant and it's been a huge difference for us because now we really get to test all our theories. Some has been spot on, some we definitely changed based on the feedback that we got. So by working on this project, how does that look like day to day? Well, even before COVID-19, but specifically now, um, it's a lot, whether you're me or anybody else in my team, uh, we work a lot on own, reading, writing, and planning. Uh, thankfully, we also get to spend a lot of time together with the people who share their stories, as well as the team. It's such a privilege to sit and listen to other people's stories. We get to come home to their you know, private spaces, they really share their life journey with us, which is always a privilege. Uh, we spend time together in a team, uh, planning, designing the activities. We will also even make sure that we share each other's stories within the team so we understand why we're here, why we're so dedicated to do this work. Of course, we do a lot of photo shoots. Again, we get to go to people's homes, but as well as like natural parks or festivals that we would never know of if it wouldn't be for our storytellers who talk about this 
meaningful places in their lives here in the Netherlands. And of course, when you are trying to collect all these stories, I spend a lot of time traveling and I'm really grateful that I also get to travel a lot within the Netherlands. Because the Netherlands is quite small, you know, it's never longer than about three hours anyway across the country. And I really enjoy it because it gives me time to reflect and adjust what just happened, what story did I listen to? So Pocket Stories and Rich Guide definitely was created because I had a personal need to figure out who I am, as well as trying to address some challenges that I saw in the world. I didn't really know exactly how to start, I just started. And looking back on my journey, I feel I was such an unlikely person to start anything, let alone a social venture. But after listening to so many people's stories uh, from all the different ages and backgrounds, specifically young people, I realized that anybody and all of us can really make a change. And we definitely, definitely don't need to be the best, not even the second or the 10th or the 100th best in the world in order to contribute to our society. And I really learned there are three things in specific that worked for me um, that helped me to create a path as a change maker. And there's one, really get to know yourself. What makes you tick? What are you passionate about? What are your superpowers and what are your weaknesses? Two, surround yourself by inspirational people. Listen to them because you will learn so much, which leads me to the third point, that like always be willing and open to learn from others. That's the reason why you don't have to be the best because you don't need to know everything. You just surround yourself and work and collaborate with people who have skills that you don't have to acquire. And additionally, be ready to also learn from your own mistakes because trust me, there will be plenty. For me, this has really worked and really has allowed me to grow and to create impact while I'm failing forward. So yeah, that's a little bit about my journey. Oh my goodness. Wow, Ingi, that was such a moving and I mean, heartfelt narrative. Thank you so much for not only all the work that you've done, but for also taking the time to, to graciously share it with us. I mean, you have a real talent for amplifying the voices of others in the work that you're doing. Um, and speaking of voices of others, before we hop on to our discussion, I want to make sure that we're including our entire audience in this experience. So for those of you at home, we would love to hear from you. So make sure you're sharing your thoughts by tagging at NatGeoEducation or using hashtag GenGeo on Twitter, on Instagram, or on Facebook. And be sure to submit any questions you have for us to the chat bar on the YouTube live, and we'll address them as they're submitted. Um, but Ingi, let's get started. I mean, you were, as you mentioned in your presentation, given your name when you were just four months old after being adopted from Korea and traveling all the way to Norway. Um, you know, what significance did this have on your life and, and on your journey? Would you mind telling us a little bit more about what it was like to grow up in Norway? Yeah, so I spoke a lot about my name um, because most people know me by Ingi simply because it's easier. Um, that was a story that I told for a long time. I go by Ingi because if I say Ingeborg, most people won't understand it. But as I left Norway, I realized that I was actually trying to reject a big part of me because I grew up actually hating my name, Ingeborg. It, it's a very traditional old school name. And I was actually giving this name um, by my grandmother on my dad's side, that's her name. And as a child, I was absolutely hating because I thought, why couldn't I have a name like Christine or Marianne or something that I thought was a little bit more uh, beautiful. Um, but as I left Norway, I realized that when I don't have that, because when I was in Norway, people knew me in a small rural village and knew who I was. Um, they saw me as Norwegian, but it was when I left Norway that I realized that I don't look Norwegian and I don't sound Norwegian. And now I didn't even bring my name with me. Um, and I realized that I had to work harder to bring my Norwegian identity to the people. And I think that's why in the beginning I was a bit defensive that I couldn't understand why people couldn't see this part of me. Um, but as a migrant, I realized that I have to tell the story of who I am. I have to show those layers because growing up in Norway, I mean, it was incredible. I had this 
very big family, loads of cousins. I'm an only child, so my cousins were very important to me. Um, growing up in nature, you know, surrounding by, um, you know, animals, um, forests and mountains and the sea, lots of blonde and blue eyed people. When you grow up just looking at that, that is your normal viewpoint. So when I moved to Australia, I, I grew up, I came to a big city, it was a lot more international. So it was almost a little bit confronting to me to see how I was seen different. And I had to work a lot harder to reveal the Norwegian side of me to the point where I overdid it a bit. And I kind of forgot that I had another side too, the Korean aspect. So that journey has really shaped me so much where I really had to focus on how to articulate who I am because I spent the biggest part of my life not really knowing who I am. And I definitely not able to put it into words. So now I definitely know better, but I definitely think it's a lifelong journey. There's always a new element that you're going to rediscover about yourself. Absolutely. And, and speaking of your childhood, you mentioned that you fell in love with the concept of storytelling as early as you know, 11 years old. You know, what was your aha moment? Like, do you think it's common to find something that you're so passionate about at such a young age? One of your first pieces of advice was to get and to know yourself and know what makes you tick and what makes you very passionate. How did you know that this would become something that you are interested in as a lifetime career? Oh, I definitely did not that this was going to be my career. Mind you, when you grow up, I think that's probably common for most rural community across the world. Um, when you think about a profession, you think about doctor, nurse, teacher, I had to have a name. Uh, in school, I loved school, but I wasn't very good with math or science. I was definitely drawn more to literature, history and languages, but they weren't career paths to me, which is something that I enjoyed. And I took solace in that the fact that I, I could enjoy them, therefore I could get at least some good grades, even though my more like mathematical and scientific um, grades weren't so good. And it wasn't until I went to high school, I chose um, a creative direction. So I was working with art and design, again, a little bit more technical. I realized I wasn't so good at that either. I liked it, but it wasn't so good. But what surprised me was that we had to take compulsory uh, ancient history and art, um, no, ancient art history classes. And I just fell in love with it. Because again, it was about learning about other people, learning about other cultures. And that's what literature and history has always done for me. So when I read Anne Frank's diary for the first time, I was so wowed about how much I could learn about say World War II, how much I can learn about being different or the value of listening to other people's story by simply reading one book, one very beautifully written book. And that for me, it didn't feel like learning. It just felt like fun. But it, it, you see the journey I had to take in order to understand, you know, that this could be a career. Even when I started Pocket Stories, I didn't know really what I was doing. It was all about trialing, erring my way to where I am today. Absolutely, for sure. And I'd like to dig into a little bit more about, you know, what a career looks like in, in collecting narratives. I think it's common for a lot of people to assume that your job is focused on the telling of the storytelling part of speaking a lot. Um, but in fact, it appears to be quite the opposite. Like your day to day seemed to be much more silent than I anticipated. Um, you have to be an exceptional listener instead. Now, how do you find the balance between the two polar opposite of actions of telling and listening? Um, and how do you manage that role? Yeah, so people who know me knows that I'm a talker and I talk very fast. Like even now I'm, I'm making sure like you speak fast, so like speak slow, others people won't understand you. Um, and definitely in my work, listening is key. And I think for all humans, listening can feel very counterintuitive. I think we tend to think we're a bit better at listening than what we actually are. Uh, we tend to confuse what hearing versus listening. Hearing is like, I hear what you're saying, but listening is really like, it's beyond the words. Uh, how are people saying? What are their emotion? What are facial expression? What are their tone? Um, to really get what people are saying. So over the years, I think I had to really understand how I work because I am a person who loves to speak. So I had to train myself to become a better listener and what helped me is to kind of put what I call like the curiosity helmet on to remind myself that I don't know this person in front of me and even this oh this person might seem so different to me maybe we have nothing in common if I put that curiosity helmet I'm thinking I just want to understand what makes this person 
that person? What makes that person tick? It is really easy to become silent because you realize you know so little. And when I'm reminded that I know so little about the person in front of me, you become automatically more silent. So it is definitely a balancing act, but I also say that a lot in workshops, and I think I said in my presentation as well, if we're all focused on telling the stories, we forget all the importance of actually listening to all those beautiful stories that are being created and shared. For sure. And you talked about those workshops a little bit, you know, um, digging into more of the day to day of your organization, um, because you do so much, you have, you focus on storytelling, you host workshops, you plan exchange programs, you participate in speaking engagements. At the end of the day, you know, what impact have you seen these initiatives have over the years? What impact? Oh, many different types of impact. I think one thing that I've realized that when I work with storytelling, it's really easy to focus on the end goal. You know, you work on a story so you can tell the story to the world. But what I really love is the process. So the stories are absolutely important because they can inspire, you know, they can provoke, they can do many things to make us feel engaged. But I think that's one of the reasons why I love the Roots Guide project, which is you know, been taking four years. It's been a really long process of listening and interviewing, um, but also the workshop is really honoring the process of figuring out, you know, what am I uncomfortable with? How do I want to represent myself? What have I gone through? Um, and when people then tell me things like, wow, it's so powerful to see that it's not just me who has a story worth telling, but there's also other people who have an equally important story to tell, but there might be different intensity levels or I am so grateful that I get a place to make sense of the things that I've gone through. I might not even share the story with anybody except myself. And I always say the most important audience for your story is yourself. Once you feel good about that, then you're ready to share it. When people tell me this, that they feel empowered by their own experiences because we can feel, we can feel so disempowered with all the things that goes around in the world and we can't really change the external things, but we can change the way we feel about it. And that's the power of storytelling that we can re-narrate. We have the power to, to change the way that we talk about ourselves, to talk about our own experiences. Um, for instance, an example that I think is very beautiful um, is that when you see people who has maybe experienced violence, um, there can be a narrative of, of being a victim, which is definitely true. But you see some people who are really resilient and persevere, the hardship that they had is to look at themselves, you know what? I am still a victim, but I'm also a survivor. Uh, I went through this really difficult time. I'm still here. I'm still really strong because I went through all of that. You didn't really change any of the events, but you changed the story. And that's what I love. And I think that's the biggest impact that I see across all the work that I'm doing is that when people get that aha moment, that I can take control of my own narrative. Yeah, and, and you have such an international impact now. And it's kind of... Um, I'm curious to know that if you expected to be at this stage that you are now when you first started Pocket Stories or even when you were going through your internships a couple of years ago, did you at all anticipate to be where you are now? Definitely not. No, not at all. Even Pocket Stories was actually um, created in the basements of my parents while I was between my travels. And it was simply because, like I was saying earlier, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I only knew I had to do something. And in the beginning, I was thinking, like, I don't even know what this is. I had definitely imposter syndrome. I felt I kept asking, who am I to do this? To the point, sometimes I felt a little bit embarrassed at what I was doing. And I definitely pushed me through a lot of comfort zones, um, thinking like, oh, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong here. But that was the importance of always surrounding myself with good people, inspirational people who were also sharing their stories of their hardship, of their struggles, of doing you know, anything that had to do with change making. That helped me a lot to realize, okay, it is very common to have these questions about yourself. It's very common to doubt that you are going to be able to do anything. Um, and even the most successful people will go through this. So that helped me to push through and make sure that I'm always focusing not what's ahead, but what am I doing right now? And what can I do with the skills and the reason I have right now? And before you know it, granted, take maybe a few years, but before you know it, you know, it just snowball effects, right? And through collaboration, and I, I would say I haven't really done anything really on my own. Everything that I've done is through collaboration, whether it's here in the Netherlands or it's been abroad. 
uh, it is because you work with other people. Absolutely. And you mentioned collaboration a lot. So I'd love to dig into the logistics of what that means a little bit more fruitfully. I mean, your ability to share these stories judiciously, respectfully, and powerfully through your organization, I think is almost as important as collecting the narratives themselves. So can you discuss the logistics of the, your collaboration? You know, who's included in these stories? How do you go about choosing which stories you listen to in the first place? And how do you navigate the stories that are going to be shared and uplifted when you find yourself giving presentations or speaking engagements? So it depends on what project I'm doing. So the workshops, there is absolutely no filtration that anybody who wants are very welcome to come and join. Um, in the past, when we did the storytelling events, uh, the only criteria that I set was I want to make sure we have different people with different migration backgrounds. That was the only thing that I cared about. For the rest, I wouldn't set any criteria. Same thing is for Roots Guide. We definitely had certain um, di different types of backgrounds that we want to cover. We want to make sure we had different uh, age range. The youngest one was 15. When they start telling the story, she's 19 today because it's been four years in making. The other one's almost 90 years old. We want to make sure that we uh, interview people from big cities to urban to rural areas, even from a farm. Uh, we want to make, again, make sure we had different people with different migration backgrounds. So these are the things that I would definitely curate in, in certain um, events and projects. But what I would not do is to filter kind of screen them like I want to hear your story first before I will say it's worth telling I would never do that because I know that every single person has something to tell and once we get those stories and we're trying to ask as open-ended questions as we can to let that person to have as much agency as they possibly can to discover what do I want to share how do you want to share it we're trying then to take all the information we're getting and then curate the content because I really don't want to filter it and after actually facilitating I think is it 400, maybe close to 500 stories for the last few years. I haven't met a single person that hasn't had a story worth telling. It, it's really, really special. And it's really a privilege to get to be transported into their world and get to see their life experience through their eyes. But that is so interesting that you hear that there's not a single story worth telling. And I mean, it, it puts kind of a, a bit of a self, uh, self-inspection lens on ourselves to, to really think critically about how each of us can bring our story forward in order to make positive change. But along with listening and amplifying and curating stories, Inky, what other practical skills do you feel as if you use on a daily basis? Does it include writing? Does it include data in any way, presenting? In what way do you find yourself practicing interdisciplinary skills? Oh my gosh, just so many things, particularly when you're an entrepreneur and you're the person who's supposed to do everything. So if you can't find a person, you're the person to do it. So a lot of reading, writing, planning, so project management is a big thing. Finance is a big thing. A lot of entrepreneurs tend not to like it. I kind of like it, even though math wasn't my thing. Somehow I, I somehow enjoyed it here. Um, I had to learn how to write scripts. In all honesty, I even had to learn how do you really write stories. So I had a communication degree, yes, but writing essays isn't the same as writing personal stories. I definitely had to learn that. Um, but then working with people from diff different disciplines, so Hamza is a designer, and Megan and, and Dan, who are scientists from two very different disciplines, uh, the hub is an artist. I didn't actually have to learn all these different things. I just got to work with them who are really excellent within their own fields. And the other things that I don't know, uh, I Google. I simply Google how to code this and this on my website. Google, how do I create an infographic video? Um, Google has actually been a great educational tool for me to manage all these different things that I need to know. Yeah, great, you have to be proactive. You have to chase that passion and that dream. And, and oftentimes I say, the way you define that dream or a dream job is that you find something that you absolutely love to do regardless. And then you find a way to figure out to be paid for that passion. And so while your mission may resonate with a lot of people, Inky, I think it's quite another obstacle to turn that passion into a career like you did. You know, what steps did you take to transform storytelling into a professional and funded endeavor, especially by a group like Nat Geo? 
this has not been easy at all. Um, and I think I speak for a lot of social entrepreneurs because a lot of social entrepreneurs you know, don't have a very strong business model. We don't put business first, it's social impact first. And this can be quite tricky. So for instance, one way that I've been managing for the last few years is that through Pocket Stories, there's been very little in order to pay people who work for Pocket Stories, but we've just been very happy to get proper funding like from National Geographic to make sure that we have all our expenses covered. And a project of Roots Guide is not very cheap in order to, to implement. So alongside, I've been able to freelance um, and do a lot of the work that is related to pocket stories, but for other organizations and companies that do have the funding. So that's the way that I try to find the golden balance uh, between doing the work that I'm really passionate about, but then also try to create a living for myself as well. Absolutely. And you know, when I listen to such inspirational people like yourself, it's kind of difficult to imagine a time for me where you're not doing this work and you haven't been doing it for decades. You know, is there a time in your life where you had no idea what you were doing whatsoever? I know you touched upon it a little bit with your internship, but most importantly, you know, how do you get through moments of uncertainty and moments of doubt? You know, what is it that gets you out of bed every single morning and makes you want to do this work, whether or not you know all the details and all the, the, the intrinsic little um, obstacles behind the door. So I, what I didn't mention in my story, I've had a lot of different jobs throughout my life um, and they're completely disconnected to what I'm doing now. I have been working in a clothing store. I've been serving kebabs. I've been a waitress, a terrible waitress, mind you. I've been doing all kinds of professions before I started my university degree in between. Um, and I think that has been part of my trial and error. I think, at least for me, it was really hard to really know what I wanted, but the only thing that I could really do was try to do different things and figure out what I didn't want. Um, and that was really the only way that I could do things. So I would try new things. And when I realized it didn't work for me anymore, I would try to make sure I didn't get stuck there. I would just not necessarily wait for the perfect opportunity, but I would just go in and say, okay, let me try this then or this. And I think that's how the snowball effect of, of trying these different things led me to where I am today. And even today, I realized that being a waitress, working in a clothing store, these things have actually given me lots of skills I'm using today. I was a manager in a clothing store that got me project management skills, how to work with different people. Uh, waitressing is about hospitality. I couldn't maybe not balance the glasses very well. I broke quite a lot of them. But I understood the aspect of hospitality and all of that I'm still bringing into work that I'm doing now because it doesn't matter if it seems relevant. All that mattered is that I was you know, trying to learn, trying something new. And that's pretty much what I've been trying my whole life. And I still don't know where I'm gonna be in 10, 20, 30 years. For sure. I mean, um, speaking of not knowing where you're going, like, you know, let's pretend for a moment that you are back in those teenage years, that you're back um, as a waitress and back out of the clothing store. What advice would you give to your past self in retrospect? Is there anything you would have done differently? And, and, and what critical knowledge would you like to share with young people who are in the same position as you were? I think it is that keep being curious of yourself. I think I always was that. But one thing I would definitely say is that also be constantly curious of others in the way that you have a lot to learn from them and never compare yourself to others. It's really easy to compare yourself thinking that, oh, this person's amazing. I too want to be like that person. And all that ended up making me feel for a long time was like, I felt incomplete. I didn't feel good enough. And I felt that I was behind. And I had this like, sense of urgency for so long, waking up feeling really stressed. Like, I'm behind, I'm behind. Until I realized behind what? And I couldn't really answer that. So I think if there's anything, because there's not many things that I would have done differently, but that's definitely one thing that I would tell myself, just, you know, slow down. It's okay. Whatever you're doing, it's going to lead somewhere as long as you keep trying. And I could ask you questions for another three hours, but I would also like to take the time to ask questions that have been posed from the audience. I mean, we have members joining us from India, from Mexico, the Netherlands, Mauritius, and like everywhere from around the world. Um, I just wanted to take the time to make sure that we're getting those conversations in as well. Um, Akash from India asks, you know, how did you used to feel earlier about being a migrant 
And how are you feeling about it now? How has your understanding of self changed throughout the years? Oh, great. Now, I grew up thinking that migrants were other people. Migrants were people that, well, honestly, I didn't really have much idea. All I knew that migrants were other people and I was definitely not it. And I worked really hard not to be a migrant through my whole life. Um, and then by going through that journey and particularly meeting these two women while I was in Tajikistan completely changed my perspective on it to the, to the point where I'm actually celebrating being a migrant. And in fact, um, my signature in my email says migrant. That is my first label because I really want to own it. I think it's something to be proud of. And I think by being a migrant, you really become resilient because you're going to be put in a situation that's going to be unknown in terms of language and place. Navigating that new society is going to be tough. So I think being a migrant isn't something to be defensive about, which I used to be for years. And it's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. It is something to truly be celebrated. So the way that I feel about it has completely changed. And that's why I'm super dedicated about migration today. And that's a fantastic answer. Um, we have another question we have from the audience is, you know, can you tell us about a migration story that had truly inspired you and connected with? Um, you know, what is one of those conversations that really opened your eyes? And can you share that with us? Okay, I could probably sit here for many more hours if I would tell all of them, but there, there are definitely some um, that really, really resonates with me not necessarily because I can identify with them but it's I can see the importance of storytelling so there is one woman who survived World War II she um she came with the children transportation during the war she was half Jewish she went through a very very difficult time where by the time the war was over her father was uh, killed in a concentration camp and her mother died just after war out of illness and she never saw any of her parents again. And she was a very young girl. And even till this day, you know, many, many years later on, it's very painful for her to share her story. And when we asked her, why do you want to share this story? She said, I don't share my story out of pleasure, but I share my story because I want us to never forget the amount of evil that anybody can do including you and me and by telling that story we you know we can be reminded that we have to think that all of us have capacity to good and we all have a capacity to hurt other people and it's only by being conscious of that we can reach out and create dialogue to understand each other better so that's definitely one story that really hit me quite hard and I've shed so many tears with so many people listen to this because even though I can't relate with that um, you can still feel so connected to that person. Absolutely. And along your entire career journey, I'm sure that you have faced your fair share of challenges and mistakes. Can you think of a moment that just seemed for a split second, you know, absolutely insurmountable? You know, what was the closest that you think you've ever come to giving up? What was the challenge and how did you get past it? Oh, uh, so many challenges. Um, I think challenges that are very technical in nature of how you I work with like different types of methodologies, what worked and what didn't work. But I think it's really myself. I think I was the worst enemy I very often that I felt that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. Um, particularly when I made mistakes, I would really punish myself hard. I felt that I should be better than that. And that has been a few roller coaster when I thought, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Look around me. There are so many other people that are doing so much better than me. Um, but I've been so grateful to work alongside incredible people where we keep lifting each other up, reconfirming that what we're doing is good and it's definitely good enough. Um, and that has been the reason why I've been able to push along the times when I thought, oh my gosh, I just want to hide from the world. I don't want to do this. Um, I feel terrible because I didn't think I was good enough. Yeah, another great question from the audience that's coming in is who is your inspiration? Like, do you have someone that you look up to as a mentor? And what are the qualities and characteristics that really drive you to be inspired by them? Oh, that's a good question. I think I have a lot of heroes um, that I just meet along my work um, that 
you know, I will, if I would say the name, you wouldn't know who they were simply because they tell their stories with me because I've learned so much um, from the people around me. And that's what allows me to grow. If I would name a person that might be, be more public, I think one of the many heroes I think right now is Brene Brown because she talks so beautifully about courage and vulnerability. And this is what I'm asking everybody around me constantly to, to, to share who they are. Um, the things that they rather want to hide away and do the things they want to celebrate. It takes courage to really show who you really are to other people. So I think the way she talks about it is just beautiful. I'm reading her books and currently listening to her podcast. That is a big inspiration to me. Right. And you've mentioned how you're listening and recording hundreds of people from across the world. Um, and they're all helping you understand how interconnected we are because of human migration. Um, what have you learned about international communities and culture or even heritage through your work? Is our world smaller or larger or more or less connected than we initially anticipated? So for me, it's definitely a lot smaller than I initially thought. Um, and the reason why I say that we're like, we're all interconnected through the migration stories because I've learned two things by working with migration stories. I will specifically um, put in the context of the Netherlands. So by listening to migration stories, what I've learned um, about the Dutch culture is that you will take something that's very typical Dutch, say the tulip, the cheese slicer, and we have like ceramics called Delft Blue. These are stereotypical Dutch. If you will get any Dutch souvenirs, these will be some of the things that you'll be getting. But when you listen to stories um, and dig a little bit deeper, you would realize the tulip is actually coming from Turkey. And it's migrants and travelers who's been bringing that from Turkey to Europe. Um, the cheese slice is actually invented in Norway. So that one was brought uh, from my home country. And then the Delft blue, the ceramics that are white and blue, are uh, actually inspired from the Chinese Ming. So if you look at our culture, everything that is around us are interconnected by different cultures because people go from one place to another. So everything around us doesn't really come just from one spot and we benefit from that. Now on a more personal level, when we talk about and share our migration stories, it's easy to focus that it's a migration story, but by putting very different types of migrant experience side by side, you aren't really focusing too much on the migration journey itself. It is actually about the human experiences. So it might be parenthood, how to set up a business, how to form romantic relationships, how to form your identity. These are things that we all focus on no matter who we are. And that's why I'm so dedicated to see that, that everybody will look and reflect upon how we connect to migration. Migration itself is not a bad thing, um, it just is. And it's deeply connected to our human culture. Oh, that's such a wonderful way to put it. And among other things, one of the most um, fascinating aspirational parts of your work, I think is how you're so focused on presenting modern solution making and also investing heavily in young people within your community. Now, why do you think it's so important to uplift and incorporate young people in all that you do? And what are some best practices that you think have found work well and, and work substantively for engaging young change makers? So um, why I work with young people, it's very easy. I when I grew up in the rural part of Norway, there was nobody ever coming knocking our door saying, hey, we're here to support you. Even though I'm, I'm super happy with the journey that I took and trialing and erring, it would have been powerful if somebody came a little bit earlier to me and helped me to figure out who I am and what am I passionate about. And that's why I'm really dedicated to work with young people. I've gone through my own journey here with pocket stories, trialing and erring. And the work that I'm doing with Change Maker Exchange and a lot of the other youth exchange program we, we've created is really to help young people to become change maker and supporting social entrepreneurs on their venture. And it isn't always about getting the technical expertise because you can always find it whether you collaborate with other people or Google them like me. Um, it is really about getting to know who you are and what drives you because the moment you have this, you understand that, Honestly, I think there's almost nothing that you can't do because you will understand what your superpowers are, but you will also understand your limitations. So that means that I know where I need to go and ask for help. And that's also something we shouldn't be so scared of doing. 
Absolutely. And, and I don't want to point out the obvious here, but when I was looking through all the pictures in your PowerPoint, you were surrounded by people in person and having those face-to-face -face interactions. What in the world is your work looking like now amidst the pandemic? And what should young people who are interested in doing a career in storytelling anticipate if they are wanting to do it, especially now amidst the time of social distancing? Yeah, so life has definitely changed um, because I'm a person that definitely loves being in person with people rather than online. Um, but I am grateful because a lot of work prior COVID-19, we were already doing online because the team in the Netherlands, we live across the country. And of course, I'm doing a collaboration in Egypt, in Italy. I'm working with people literally from all around the world. So I am accustomed to do things online. Though not super happy about being in lockdown and how to put all my work virtually, there are a lot of opportunities about connecting online. And one of the beautiful things that I've experienced is that, for instance, at a hub that I showed earlier in the, uh, in the photos, she's the only one of the Ruska team who don't live in the Netherlands. So when we would meet in person um, and she wanted to join in, she had to be on the screen. But now that we were all on the screen, we all get to participate on an equal footing. And that's also what I see now with a lot of these youth exchange is that some of us have passports that allow us to travel quite freely, right? Uh, definitely my Norwegian passport is really powerful. By organizing now events for young people online, it means that anybody, no matter where you are, as long as you have an internet connection, can come and join in. And that's what we had with a participant from Iraq who actually got rejected his visa to come to the Netherlands a couple of years ago. He could finally join in on the equal ground. And he said, it's not just because I'm from Iraq and I don't get my visa, it's because all of us are in it together. And we get to share and connect with people we would never meet if it wouldn't be for this online platform. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity in this more tricky and difficult time. You know what, Ingi, like I, I'm sold. Like as soon as I want to close my laptop and get off this call, I want to know what the next steps are to be substantively involved in this work or what I should be doing if I wanted to get involved in storytelling in the first place. So what pieces of advice would you have? You know, what is your call to action to a lot of students that are sitting and being inspired and listening to your speak right now? So what I would do, all the things I would suggest now is great because it's all up to you. I would start maybe reflecting and maybe writing a little bit of who am I and start exploring a little bit of, you know, who am I? What is my purpose? What is, where does my passion lie? Whether that is working with migration like me, climate change, reducing plastic, food, health, it doesn't really matter. And then start thinking about who do you I want to learn more from? Um, either it's because people are inspirational to me or people are very different than me and thinking differently. Where can I go and listen to learn more, but also to start honing my listening skills? This is honestly the way that I started. And the moment you start finding a combination of what you're passionate about, who you are, and you start talking and listening to more people, step by step, you will start saying, okay, this is what is fascinating to me. Maybe this is a little bit less fascinating. This is what I can do. This is whom I can work with. And before you know it, you'll be creating something unique on your own. So that will be my biggest advice. Well, I think that's enough work for me to do. I know exactly what I'm going to be doing after this conversation is over. But Ingi, thank you so much for taking the time so graciously out of your evening to talk to us. Um, it was such an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sahar. I really enjoyed it. And I wish you a good day in the U.S. Well, thank you. And also thank to all of you guys who are watching. Please make sure to share your thoughts by tagging at NACGEO Education or using the hashtag GenGeo on social media. And if you're available this Friday at 2 p.m., you have to join the PhotoCamp live session with photographers Lujan Agusti and Sitali Fabian, who will be exploring the connection between identity, culture, and place. Um, and so it fits in very beautifully with the conversation that we've had about migration with Ingi. So if you're inspired by today's talk, I can truly think of no better way than to continue to your storytelling journey. Also make sure you're marking your calendars for next week at the same time, Tuesday, July 28th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. Join me for a discussion with Angelo, who is a marine ecologist interested in studying the biodiversity and ecology of our marine world. 
Um, it's all about coastal and deep sea ecosystems, a conversation you definitely don't want to miss. So go ahead and make sure that you register for it now. But until then, thank you so much for joining us and make sure that you're staying curious.